September 25th, Sunday. Rain's forecast. I should be getting home to mow the lawn. But I can't help myself. I cannot cross a bridge without stopping to look for signs of otters. Nothing today. Only the tracks of someone's dog and a badger. I'll be back again tomorrow. Once you start looking in on a river, it's impossible to stop. It wasn't just an obsession with otters that led to this film. I grew up by a river, and my first attempts at wildlife filming were done there using my father's home cine camera. My father loved and campaigned to restore the health of the river. After he died, I thought, how can I pick up where he left off? He was a doctor and was aware, perhaps more than anyone, how important clean water is for life to exist how we have to take the time to look at what's going on beneath the surface. If no one knows that water voles are in steep decline, then how can we do anything about it? Wildlife now needs a helping hand. I'm a cameraman. The best thing I can do is show what we stand to lose. A film about rivers has to include otters. But I've burnt my fingers trying to film them in Britain in the past. They're nocturnal and very hard to find. July 29th. I'm following up a tip-off about an otter sighting. It's one thing to see an otter, quite another to film it. I get set up, but I'm far from hopeful. My scent could carry on even the slightest breeze. First I go somewhere high to look for telltale ripples. A little egret flushing out fish with its feet is a good sign. There'll be food here for otters too. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I see, I can hardly believe it, an otter just beyond the rocks. I resist the urge to move closer to get a clearer view. Otters are a bit short-sighted, but they have an incredible sense of smell. Gradually, it works its way closer. Then it's gone. I try not to panic. Experience or instinct or something tells me this otter won't have gone far. I'm relieved to pick it up again not far downstream. The water is slower and the river is deeper here, so its dives take longer. While it's underwater, I can play grandmother's footsteps, making a quick dash to a better filming position before it surfaces. Judging by this otter's large size and bold features, it's a male. The wound on his nose is probably from a fight with a rival.
like a fish, he's using every part of his body to manoeuvre underwater. Sliding through the thick weed gives him the element of surprise. In murky water and in the dark, an otter can sense and ambush fish just by using its whiskers. I've been with this same otter for several hours now. I never imagined it was even remotely possible to keep track of a wild otter in a river for this long. Over the next few days, my luck holds. On a different stretch of water, where the river is slow and at its deepest, I find the same otter again. He's panting hard for breath. It's not the current wearing him out. When diving deep, it's his own buoyancy that he has to fight against. Along a territory that could be 30 or 40 miles of river, he prefers to hunt in shallower places, where a lively current encourages healthy weed and lots of fish. Ducks like it too. Otters like eating ducks, but here it's just too shallow for an otter to catch them from below. Even so, the ducks keep their distance. The well-oxygenated water below the weir is a real draw for all kinds of river life. I learn that if the ducks are out of the deep water, an otter could be nearby. They're much better wildlife trackers than me out of necessity. I'm struck by this otter's constant search for food. He never seems to stop to rest. The weir is a place that crayfish thrive, and I'm sure it's this, and not fish, that he's mostly eating. Crayfish are not as nutritious as fish, and maybe explains why he has to hunt out so many of them. It's satisfying to feel I can sometimes second-guess this otter. Perhaps he's starting to get used to me, except that all I do is keep still and watch him. Adult dog otters are solitary creatures. I can relate to that, but he even shakes me off. It's the last I see of him for a while. Diary entry for Wednesday, 23rd of August. No wind, poor light, 
but a very good day. family of four otters. It's rare for so many cubs to survive to this age. The one seeing off the moorhen is an adult female. The other three are cubs. They must be close to maybe a year old. By sticking close together, they help each other. Any fish flushed out by one of them has three other hungry mouths to escape. The chances are these cubs were fathered by the dog otter I've been filming, but he won't be joining them. Male otters don't have anything to do with cub rearing. They're keeping a close eye on the far bank where I'm filming from. Some walkers have stopped on the footpath behind me to watch. The otters are watching them back. They don't seem concerned. Maybe they've become very smart at keeping us at a distance. They disappear up the bank of a quiet island that divides the river into two and where nobody goes. I imagine them curled up in a big heap somewhere, fast asleep. That's the nature of filming. Twenty intense minutes, followed by hours, even days, of waiting and hoping. Just before I head home, I catch a slight movement in the reeds. It's teeming with birds. Not the kind of birds you'd expect to see by a river, but hedgerow, woodland, garden visiting birds, like long-tailed tits. There's also a chiff-chaff. When I look a bit closer, I realise they're gorging themselves on aphids. If conditions are good, aphids reproduce at an astonishing rate. The females duplicate themselves like machines, without needing male mates. It's been a long, dry summer, but here the river keeps the sap flowing. As the aphids tap into the sap, the birds tap into them. With such easy pickings, they hardly know which way to turn. In a few weeks' time, the willow warbler will be making a long journey back to Africa for the winter. 
This will help it get fit. I wouldn't have spotted the aphids if it hadn't been for the otters. I like it when one thing leads to another. Rivers are like that, always leading you on, and once they've got you hooked, they don't let go. Six months later, I'm exploring a quiet chalk stream, in the hope of finding what was my father's favourite bird. Diary entry, March 24th. Camping. Found lovely kingfisher site, S-I-T-E. V dot pleased. It's a male. The nest is at the end of a tunnel, dug high up in the bank, hidden by ivy. Another kingfisher joins him. She's on the right. I know she's a female because the lower half of her beak is red. Seeing them together near the nest is exciting. Kingfishers are mostly solitary creatures. They wouldn't pair up unless they really meant business. The female sits tight, waiting to see what the male has on offer. The male's brought a stickle back. I love it that she doesn't even take the slightest step towards him. She makes sure it's dead, then swallows it head first so the spines don't catch in her throat. About 30 minutes later, the male is back with another fish, a minnow. The male feeding the female is a sure sign that they're going to breed. Only ten minutes after that, a third catch. The male is showing her he's got a good supply of fish and that he knows how to catch them. And then, the exciting prospect of having a whole family to film in due course. The male's off again. But this time, the female doesn't wait for him on the bower but disappears into the nest and stays there for a while. After 30 minutes, the male returns with his fourth fish. The female appears briefly, but flies straight back into the nest. The male waits patiently for five or six minutes. But she's just not interested in being fed anymore.
I thought maybe he'd eat the fish, but eventually he flies off with it. If the male comes back to take a turn in the nest, I'll know they've started incubating their eggs. While I'm waiting, there's other activity in the hazel tree. A wren, checking out a possible nest site of its own. It's right to be worried about the squirrel, though its nest looks safer than the crumbly earth bank the kingfishers are using. The next day, both male and female kingfisher begin taking turns in the nest hole. In about 20 days' time, I expect to see them feeding newly hatched chicks. Until then, I decide to return to the river where I first filmed water voles some 30 years ago. Back then, they were common but I didn't have the skills to film them very well. Now that filming is my job, I struggle to find them at all. They've become extremely rare in Britain, so I'm really excited when I find a burrow and fresh green droppings. Ripples from under the bank make my heart race. Not what I was expecting at all. A mink. It's hunting the water voles and could wipe all of them out in this area. They're so bad for water voles because the females are small enough to squeeze into the vole's burrows. Originally brought into Britain for fur farming, there's little point hating them. They're just rather a beautiful animal in the wrong place. It has seen me, but because I'm downwind and downstream, it hasn't yet smelled me, so it seems unsure whether I'm a threat or not. While it's trying to find a way past me, I notice that it floats higher in the water than an otter. I'd like to get out of its way without disturbing it, but the slightest movement will frighten it. It'll find a way around by another route. I move on too, to try my luck elsewhere. It doesn't make sense to try filming water voles here any longer. But further downstream, I find another of their predators. The barn owl's favorite, is the smaller field vole, but they take young water voles too. Herons will take both youngsters and adults. The riverbank is a dangerous place. In my search for water voles, I find myself filming an animal I've almost never seen photographed in the wild. A water shrew. Bigger than a common shrew, but still tiny. Hardly the length of my thumb. But it's a major predator. It has venom in its saliva. 
It's a bit like a miniature otter in a way. And like an otter, it has special adaptations for life in the water. It can close its ears, has bristles on its tail and hind feet to help it paddle. And like the otter, it has long whiskers to home in on food in the dark and in the mud of a stream bed. Watching a water shrew in the wild like this is probably a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Friday, 8th of April. Overgrown riverbank with plenty of cover, more like the countryside of my father's childhood. Water vole heaven. Water voles don't hibernate, but they tend to stay underground in winter and begin to emerge again as the weather warms up. Fresh food is a priority. Spring shoots are particularly high in protein. It's risky leaving the hole. The bare riverbank leaves it exposed. It looks like this could be a pregnant female. Like Ratty in Wind in the Willows, she gathers food to be eaten in the safety of her own home. Just nearby, I find a water vole with a distinct scar on its tail. It'll help me distinguish this individual from any others I see. It's the breeding season and this water vole is high on hormones. I feel like turning the camera off when things get too personal. But it's a rare thing to see, and now I can be sure it's a male. What looks like scratching for fleas isn't at all. He's spreading oil from flank glands onto his feet so that he'll have a personalised scent trail wherever he goes. People often mistake water voles for rats. The differences are quite subtle. A water vole's ears are smaller covered with hair and difficult to make out. Its face is chubbier and more rounded. Unlike rats, water voles are mainly herbivores. They burn energy at a very high rate, so they have to eat a lot. I notice some of his claws are missing. He's seen a few fights in his time. It suggests he's a hardened campaigner. I think of him now as Scartail. He can't spend too long feeding. His number one concern is to stop other males from invading his patch. But he doesn't lay claim here with scented footsteps alone. At strategic points, 
A pile of droppings make it more than clear that this area of riverbank belongs to him. Scartail puts extra effort into certain spots, building a mound. <coughs> then urinating on it. I gradually learn he has a regular circuit. If stream levels rise, his scent will be washed away, so he does the rounds even more frequently during spells of wet weather. Females will be in season, so he's keeping a very interested nose to the ground. It's vital he gathers information about all his neighbours. It's like reading a village notice board. His fresh dropping is now the latest headline. Time to patrol the other side of the river. The moorhen may have mistaken Scartail for a rat, but a rat would have a longer tail, more visible ears and that bounding gait. Scartail arrives upstream, just to my right. Straight away he picks up a foreign scent, of this female. She's already pregnant, so she avoids him. They play cat and mouse. He hunts. She hides. She puts down her own scent mark. Not so much for Scartail, more to tell other females to keep out that she has a claim here. The more time I spend here, the more interesting it gets. I've got to know a third water vole. He lives downstream to the left of where I film from and he has an uncanny knack of knowing when it's safe to go trespassing. His fur has a redder tinge to it, and his tail isn't damaged, so I dub him Smooth Tail. Smoothtail overwrites Scartail's scent with his own, in the same places, in the same way. It's a bold move, and he's careful not to stay in the same place for long.
playing dead in front of this mother duck is a wise tactic. If she were to mistake him for a rat, she could do him some serious damage. He looks younger than Scartail. His claws are all intact. He's not beaten up. After each secret incursion, he drifts home on the current. If he ever needs an emergency exit, the current will work in his favour. It's like some sort of bedroom farce, the water voles crossing and recrossing the river, always avoiding each other. It's hard to work out what's going on. But gradually I begin to see that Smoothtail isn't risking a bruising encounter with Scartail for nothing. He's desperate to find a female he can mate with. He's got her scent now. She appears suddenly. He chases her into the water. She dives to get away. Scartail spots this from the other bank and crosses back over in hot pursuit. Smoothtail doesn't panic. He knows places he can hide. But Scartail has picked up his scent. Now he's really onto him. I've never seen him move so fast. It doesn't take him long to flush the younger male out. No big fight, though. It isn't surprising. Most animals try to avoid bloodshed. Even so, they both scent mark vigorously on opposite sides of the river. Their rivalry will continue, but the lush spring growth gets in the way of filming. I just have to be glad that water voles have hung on here. Diary entry for Wednesday, 25th of April, Port Meadow. Long hours waiting for the great crested grebes to do something. The pair seem subdued, when they should really be flamboyantly displaying to each other. Their feathers are so well adapted to staying dry that it's quite a struggle for them to wash. Other birds get out of the water to dry and preen their feathers. But these do it by rolling over onto one side.
Feathers that come loose are often eaten to help digest their food. Like geese and swans, they're very loyal. They stay together for life. And only if one of them dies will the other go and look for a new partner. At last, a first attempt at courtship. Even though it's half-hearted and brief, it's just enough to stop me from giving up. The male's second approach isn't much more successful. I return a few days later to find the male very busy. He's putting a lot of effort into building a nest. The female isn't having any part of it. I'm puzzled why she's cold-shouldering him when the male couldn't really be more enthusiastic. If they're to mate successfully this year, she really should be helping him. Finally, she pays him a bit of attention, and that's the encouragement he needs. Just as she's close by and watching, the male displays to her from on the nest. Then I see what she might see. The nest seems very low in the water. She's not going to lay eggs in it if they're going to get wet. The male isn't about to give up. Perhaps some lily pads will impress her.
the females much more interested. But it's still not the spectacular courtship dance that great crested grebes are renowned for. The male displays from the nest again, but seems dispirited when the female ignores the invitation to join in. The nest is still barely clear of the water. At last, a female gets on. She seems hesitant, as if their mating display hasn't properly run its course. The male carries on regardless. After they mate, the female begins to match his moves, get into the groove. Her head tilting isn't her looking up in the sky at something. It's all part of the ritual. Another mating seems a bit rushed, as if they're just going through the motions. The third attempt is a total bungle. I've not seen a pair behave quite like this before. And it's only after filming is interrupted due to torrential rain that I begin to realise what's wrong. It's turning out to be one of the wettest Aprils on record, as if the monsoon has come to Britain. And when the weather finally clears a few days later, I find a moorhen on the sodden nest. The grebes aren't challenging it, which suggests they've abandoned the nest. The female is nowhere to be seen. It's as if she knew all along there was trouble ahead. Even for these consummate water birds, the constantly rising river proves too much. In my father's day, it would never have been in spate like this, right in the middle of the breeding season. In places where the riverbank has more height, the water voles can move into burrows higher up. But they can only cope with so much. Elsewhere, where the landscape is flat, they've nowhere to hide. It's just one more blow to their survival. Diary entry Wednesday, 2nd of May. Kingfisher chicks should have hatched five days ago. 9.12am, male arrives. Sits a minute, then leaves upstream. 1050 Male returns from downstream with fish. Calls for female.
leaves downstream, returns almost straight away with same fish. Can't be sure they have chicks until I see a fish delivered into the nest. 11.06, male returns for third time without fish. 11.06, looks like he's on his own. I'm really worried now. two p.m. I leave for a break. My feet in the water have lost all feeling. 5.30, female finally shows. But she disappears when a tractor comes to mow the field. Light pour, so I leave. Their nest has failed. Who knows, maybe a mink or a stoat raided it. I'll never really know for sure. It's hard enough for these birds, even without the seasons seesawing around you. Back on the main river, in willows damaged by flooding, I'm luckier. Something seldom seen, and possibly never filmed before. Water voles in trees. It's certainly a first for me. They're even using their tails to hang on. On the sturdier branches, they carry on scent marking, just as they would down on the riverbank. Checking to see who else is about, it's business as usual, even though they're two or three metres up. Sometimes it's obvious they're just not cut out for life in the trees. At other times, they seem quite happy to take risks. They don't seem to mind if they fall. I think they feel safe over the water. Sometimes they jump on purpose. They remind me a little of beavers, gnawing through bigger branches to get at shoots they can't otherwise reach. It's possible that this tree climbing is one way they're learning to avoid mink. Perhaps this is evolution in action. The water voles simply shifting their patterns of behaviour in order to survive. The mallards have done well this spring in spite of the flood. Their large brood isn't tied to a nest, and the young can feed themselves. This helps cushion them against unpredictable summers. The river never stays the same. It changes day by day. There's always something happening, something I haven't noticed before. Maybe that's why I can't stop watching.
Diary entry, 19th of June, camping. Got up 4am, a proper summer dawn. Found otters, a mother with two cubs. At last, I get to film otters eating something that's big enough to identify. It's one of their most unusual meals. This youngster is eating what seems to be a rook. I can only guess at how they caught it. Otters sometimes hunt out in fields and woods, not just on water. That's the mother. She makes what she can of one of the wings. They don't often catch birds. It shows what good opportunists otters are. They don't waste a scrap. A few minutes later, there's only the beak left. As soon as they've gone, I swim out to get a closer look at what's left. The only way to make certain it really was a rook. The next day, I come across the same family with a more conventional meal. It's the remains of an unusually large fish. A big catch is easier to deal with out of the water and provides a rare chance to see the otters properly. It's hard to tell what it is, but there aren't many British rivers healthy enough for fish this big to survive. When I see the jaw and huge teeth, I know it can only be a pike. There's not much left. The mother leaves them to it, goes off to catch something else. The mother's caught an eel. She's not going to share it. High in fat are a big favourite of otters. The others are full. The older cub's so greedy he nearly chokes on a bone. When he recovers, he finds himself adrift from his family. The current's strong here. He could suddenly be left behind. All safely together again, the last time I see them. I'm away filming abroad through the autumn, and when I return, I'm in for a shock. The winter is turning out to be the coldest on record for 25 years.
heavy snowfall changes everything. It's as if you've gone somewhere new. In fact, I can't go anywhere. I'm snowed in. It's mid-December. I'm stuck at home, unable to reach the river to look for the otters. Small cubs could be emerging from their halts now. As soon as it thaws a little, I head straight back to the river. Despite the cold snap, the river only partly freezes over. I can see tracks. The otters and their cubs must be about here somewhere. But days are short and I don't manage a sighting of them. Instead, I get absorbed by icicles, a rare sight where I live. Spray collects and freezes onto dead stems, forming glass slippers like in a fairy tale. Another is like a giant's foot. In reality, though, it must be harsh for the poor water voles, huddled up together inside their burrows. I wonder whether ice sculptures keep leaves fresh enough for the survivors to eat if they make it through the winter. Late March, still really cold, 15 degrees below freezing. Warmed by summer heat slowly released from the ground, the river temperature only drops a few degrees. The water is cold, but it's so much warmer than the air that it steams like a Turkish bath. Fish are kept alive, but are sluggish and a little easier for a family of otters to catch. The mothers made a prize catch, a big eel. The stronger cub tries to make off with it. Eels are tough creatures. They can breathe air and stay alive out of the water for some time. This cub is only just managing to restrain it. Otters are more nervous and watchful out of the water. At night, a badger might try and steal a meal like this. In the past, wolves and bears would have been a threat. It's much too exciting a catch for the smaller cub to ignore. Not long ago, eels were disastrous for otters. They had a high build-up of a farm chemical in their fat cells that made male otters sterile, and otters nearly died out. 
I remember my father testing the water in the river near our house. He seemed to know when things weren't right. Since some of the problem chemicals have been banned, otters have returned. But rivers are still polluted and eels aren't common anymore. One this big is a rare treat for these two. Not much left to fight over. Still, the dominant cub won't let go. The younger cub gives up and goes to join its mother. She's catching crayfish. These otters eat a lot of crayfish. They're the introduced kind that have almost entirely replaced our smaller native ones. They can't eat them all, but I can't help hoping the otters eating them might restore some balance. I can't quite believe that I'm seeing such intimate family moments. With otter numbers improving, I've been able to conquer my 20-year-old problem trying to film them. Although I still mostly only find their droppings, called sprite. They're usually left in obvious strategic places, near bridges, by river junctions or on mounds. I can't smell the information contained within them, the age, sex, and so on, but they do give me an insight into what they're eating. You can see the fish bones in this one. It's always a thrill to find fresh prints. The family will have passed through only last night. I don't always catch up with them, but knowing otters are out there again, that they've recovered from near extinction is enough. My father once told me the wonderful thing about surgery is that people recover. They bounce back, given a bit of careful nursing. He'd have been delighted by the otter's amazing comeback, but not really surprised. Whenever I hear too much bad news, I like to remember his optimism. It's a damp, cold February day with the river in full flood when I find a mother with a really new cub. It's done well to get this far. It's too young to feed itself yet. Certainly not old enough to go fishing in strong currents.
Seeing this otter watch over her cub, I can't help thinking of my father smiling and watching me, seeing how this river is getting under my skin, becoming something I care about. I'll be stopping by that bridge again, checking for otter tracks in the morning.